Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Orcaflex 11.1 user group meetings. This is our uh, second session where we'll be covering the new features in Orca Wave. Uh, my name is David Heffernan. I'm in charge of software development at Orkina. And uh, with me, I have Chris Heaton, who's the lead developer for Orca Wave, um, and James Carlyle, who's uh, uh, one of our um, senior software developers. And um, I'll be presenting to begin with and, and hand over to Chris a little bit later on and um, uh, we're all here to help with um, with any questions that you that you have. Now um, as you know we would normally run these meetings in person but the pandemic has uh, pushed us online. Um, I suppose there's one benefit, um, uh, at least one benefit that uh, some of the um, physical venues, um, well some of the some of the people that maybe couldn't get to the physical venues that we, we traditionally go to will be able to attend. And if this is your first first time, um, a very warm welcome. And uh, if we have any um, old timers or regulars who are joining us um, uh, once again, then uh, welcome to you also. Now these meetings, we usually have them um, around uh, the end of the year. This one was planned for the end of 2020, but um, it was delayed. It was delayed because the Orcaflex 11.1 release was delayed, um, and that was delayed not because of the pandemic. For for once, the pandemic's not to blame, um, but that was because um, the new restart feature that we'd uh, we've introduced in 11.1 in Orcaflex was a was a huge task, and uh, it just took us longer um, than usual to wrap it up. We wanted to make sure that it was in a in a good place before we before we released. So having delayed the release of the software and having moved the uh, meetings uh, online, we decided to um, also move the meetings to coincide with the software release. Um, for this year, we're hoping to get back to our usual release slot um, towards the end of the year 2021. So it's going to be a shorter development cycle than usual. So um, you can expect that um, 11.1 is a, is, a, is, a, is a less ambitious release than, sorry, 11.2 is a less ambitious release than 11.1 has been. Now, if anyone has any questions on, uh, on what, what we're presenting, please ask them in the, the Q&A feature in, uh, in Zoom. Um, often we will actually um, leave them open and uh, answer them uh, live at the, uh, at the end, because that way everyone can hear the answer um, and also we'll capture it for um, capture the answer for the recordings, which is which is valuable to, to a wider group of a group of people. Um, yeah, these um, these sessions are recorded. They will be available um, on demand. If you um, if you if your colleagues want to watch this, then you can either um, they they can either register. Um, Register even after the after the webinars, and then you, you'll be able to watch them watch them on demand. Or next week we'll be publishing um, the recordings on our website. So, um, if um, you have colleagues that aren't able to be here that would like to get um, you know see the content, then um, that's always going to be possible. That's another benefit of doing um, doing them online. Right, um, we're talking about uh, Orca Wave. Um, today and uh, the new features introduced in 11.1 and it's quite a long list um, most of them I can I can zip through relatively uh, relatively quickly um, and at the end uh, Chris is going to take a little bit more time um, and talk about future developments and future developments that are in the pipeline already and potential future developments and how we how we we're thinking about um, what what to do uh, with Orca Wave um, as it goes on. Right, um, I will start also by um, showing you the, the documentation for, um, for what's new. Whenever you get a new version of, uh, of Orca Wave or indeed of Orca Flex, help, what's new, and you have a list of the new features with links through to the, the more detailed documentation. So in, in the course of a of a one-hour session um, as we're doing today. We can't cover this in huge amounts of detail and I'm sure probably not everybody wants to have the gory detail of every single new feature. Um, so um, 
view the presentation really as, as, as showing you what's new and then if you want to find out more in depth come to the come to the documentation for that now Orca wave is our diffraction radiation code um, released um, in the uh, the previous release uh, alongside uh, 11.0 and um, since then we've continued um, to develop it um, but it's still relatively new um, so I, bef before I before I get into the new features in 11.1 I'm just going to go back and have um, have a recap of an introduction as to what OrcaWave is just um, just for anybody who is perhaps not already very familiar with it so yes we we introduced this in 11.0 um, and we regard it as part of the OrcaFlex package. Um, you don't need to, to license it separately. You know, once you have a license for OrcaFlex, that comes with OrcaWave inclusive, comes with the diffraction capability inclusive. Um, although it's in the same um, package, we've actually implemented it as a separate program, which is which is OrcaWave, and. Um, We've done that because because I think the user interface just works better, um, works better in a separate program. It doesn't really fit trying to jam it in. We had originally thought about putting it inside OrcaFlex, but I think this 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 works better. Um, so yeah, it's a standalone program. After you perform an analysis in in OrcaWave, you can save the results file, and these can be imported directly into OrcaFlex. And because we control both programs complete knowledge of all the, the conventions that import procedure is um, it's very simple reliable um, there's there's no concern about have I got the conventions right and are, uh, are my origins in the right place um, so that's a, that's a really nice um, uh, nice feature by having uh, it all in one package I'm just going to uh, just have a little a quick tour through the um, through the program's interface. It's uh, a series of pages um, with data on the left, some uh, drawing and, and validation next, and then once you've done an analysis, that the final pages are are to do with the results and the output. So the calculation page allows you to control exactly how you do the calculation. There's lots of different options, ranging from you know first order through to full. Um, full QTF and and within that there's a, there's a load of different um, options as to how you actually do the uh, do the analysis. So like when I start changing these, then you know options change and whatnot. Um, the environment page is where you define the wave uh, frequencies and headings that are to be considered. On the bodies page, you can define one or more. Uh, bodies to be analyzed, diffracting bodies to be analyzed. Um, you know, we have support for multi-body. Uh, we don't currently have or even have intention to uh, include any meshing capabilities in our software. We expect you to provide a mesh. Now, um, it turns out I think that that's actually, um, you know, that's, that's not proved to be too big a deal because um, we have a very wide range of support for uh, mesh formats, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in just a minute. I'm going to skip the next few pages and um, uh, hop into the mesh view, uh, where we can uh, we can see visualization of the mesh. It has all the same standard. Um, you know, it looks very similar to an Orcaflex um, 3D view. You can control. Um, what is shown, um, you know, panel indices, you can see uh, see those numbers that can sometimes be useful. Normals, check that the normals are pointing in the right direction, that um, you've got your, um, you know, mesh configured correctly. There's a whole range of, uh, whole range of options there. Um, we have a validation page. Um, and this is quite a clean mesh. There's only one warning, but if, if uh, sometimes there can be huge numbers of warnings here, it, it can be a mess. But it's always important to know as soon as possible if there are problems with your uh, with your mesh. Um, that helps you um, fix it. You fix it before you do the analysis, um, if at all possible. So I've got nice integration here um, to the 
to the mesh view uh, and let's just see this warning it says there are gaps in the mesh um, uh, next to edges of these particular um, panels I can show those panels I can show them on their own I can show them um, with all the others highlighted in white if I put the panel indices on then I can uh, I can you can probably make out that inside here there's a um, there's a gap so these validation and and uh, visualization tools uh, have proved very very effective at um, you know helping you make helping you set your model up correctly now if I run the analysis I get the same warning that I saw on the validation page and um, it runs very very quickly because I've um, I've got it's quite a small mesh um, I've not got a huge number of, uh, of wave frequencies and I've got a 24 processor machine and um, Orca wave takes full advantage of um, all the, 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 the processing cores that you have um, you know different result plots for different um, uh, wave headings and then uh, results tables where you can get the actual actual numbers. Uh, the software can be automated through Python, MATLAB, um, in much the same way as, as OrcaFlex itself is uh, is automated. Okay, um, I'll go back now and start talking about the the new functionality that we've added since um, since we released eleven point naught, and we did some of this um, in minor updates, but. Um, I will I will mention uh, mention them along the way. So some of these were in 11.0 minor updates, and some have come in in 11.1. In but since when we released 11.0, we supported um, mesh formats for the WAMIT, GDF, and associated formats, and also uh, Nemo DAT. Um, since then, we've added support for Hydrostar meshes, Aqua, CSAM, and GMesh formats, and. Um, it's it's so long as we understand what the what the the rules around the format is and, and how it's structured then adding another uh, mesh format is actually relatively straightforward and so if anyone um, if anyone has any suggestions for other formats that they feel um, uh, would be useful we had a suggestion um, earlier today for um, obj files which I think is um, is a good idea um, let us know, give us some feedback, and uh, and we're always open to, uh, to adding more formats to make it easier for you to get your data into the program. Now, the next um, the next big thing uh, I think that's that's quite important to talk about is uh, performance. When we released eleven point naught, even then we were aware that uh, the performance of um, the calculation performance was not as efficient as it should be. So we concentrated on making sure that the code was correct and that the output was accurate. Um, however, we hadn't spent um, any significant time in, in making sure that the performance was good. Um, and we knew, even when we released, we knew there were lots of opportunities to work on the performance. We just ran out of time for the 11.0 release cycle. Now, since then, we have done a lot of changes to improve the performance and now I think the, the performance of, of, of the program is, is very, very good and, and comparable if not better than, than many of the, um, uh, the similar programs uh, that are around. In 11.0D we introduced an iterative linear solver uh, that was to complement the uh, direct linear solver that was um, already present. This is the um, accelerated gauss seidel algorithm that is used um, also by WAMIT and you get to choose which one uh, you want um, to use and for larger meshes the iterative solver um, can be very effective. Um, in 11.1 .1, we have further optimized both iterative and direct solvers um, and particularly the direct LU solver. We've, we've replaced um, our previous uh, LU code, which was um, performed rather poorly, replaced it with something that's extremely efficient. Um, and in fact, now it's so efficient that it's actually quite hard to find meshes that have um, sufficiently large um, numbers of panels 
such that the iterative solver is faster. I think you you, you need something like twenty or thirty thousand um, uh, that sort of level of of, of panels. Um, I, I, I'm 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 slightly uh, I'm not one hundred percent sure that, that that sort of figure is right, but it, it's it's a it's a very large number of panels before you end up. Um, uh, in a case where the iterative solver is faster. So generally we would recommend um, using the direct solver. It's it's really remarkable um, how well it performs. We've also added some uh, some diagnostics um, tools to let you let you help um, make those decisions. So um, if this this model uses a uh, direct LU and um, if I look at the results tables and I look at a new page in the results tables called diagnostics then it tells us about uh, the time taken to actually perform this calculation. So I've loaded a results file here so the calculations already happened. It was done on this machine, my desktop machine with 24 um, cores. The calculation um, well, 377 seconds of calculation time we used, but they were that's the total across all the cores. In terms of elapsed wall clock time, it was only seven, 16 seconds because these 377, lots of it happened in parallel. Um, and in terms of the actual linear solve part of the calculation, so the linear solve, the linear matrix solves, um, using in this case direct LU, there were only 6 seconds. And that, that 6 seconds is, again, spread over all the calculations that six out of 370 second, seconds was spent doing the linear solve. So it's a tiny actual fraction um, of the time. So, I mean, that changes. If, if you have um, bigger meshes than this one, then you might find that the balance between you know, time spent doing LU and other um, parts of the calculation, the, the, um, the ratios can change. So it's worth um, just checking this out and getting, getting to understand that with your um, with your particular um, case. If I uh, jump over to the, the exact same model but solved using the iterative solver and look at the same diagnostics page then we see that we've now spent well 45 seconds doing um, the linear solve so an extra 40 seconds on top um, of what we did last time which is why this has gone from 370 to 410 um, it's still only 18 seconds in wall clock time because of the parallelization, but now there's a bigger portion of the time spent doing, um, you know, doing the calculation, doing the linear solves. Um, I should say, uh, maybe I can see in the mesh details how many um, how many panels there are. It's only 430 panels, so it's a pretty small mesh. Um, if you had a bigger mesh, then um, then things would look a little bit different. Uh, but as I said, you have to go a very long way before um, the iterative could be direct. And it's also interesting to note that um, 60 of the iterative solves are marked as failed. And what that indicates is when, for some reason, um, the iterative solver is unable to converge to the solution um, to the specified tolerance in the maximum number of iterations. So, so yeah, I mean, you might play around with that to, to get better performance. But what, what Orcawave does is it says, OK, we couldn't um, solve it with the iterative solver. I'm just going to go back and, and, and use the direct um, LU solve. So it switches over to do that. And once for one particular group of calculations, it's switched over to direct to, to the direct solver. It stays with the direct solver, which is why there's a lot more than 60 um, direct solves here. Um, so yeah, this is a useful useful page for helping you work with um, work with diagnosing performance. The other issue to do with um, well, sorry, before I leave that, I should just say that um, oftentimes um, you see that the amount on the linear solve is a fraction of the time spent on the overall calculation. So um, you know, there's we've done a, we've done a good job of uh, of, of optimizing that. And um, it's less, much less significant this this choice altogether, um, I believe. Now, on the validation page, um, we talk about um, this is new information where we talk about the estimated peak memory required. Now, this is the other side of performance. If you are using a um, a many 
process a machine, then uh, it's not uncommon that you can consume all of the memory. The, the, with a large mesh, the matrices that we solve can be, can be um, very large. They're complex valued, um, which again makes them, makes them big. Uh, you multiply it by the number of threads you're using, and you can um, quite easily and you know, rapidly run out of memory. So um, this, um, this tool gives you an estimate of how much memory is going to be used per thread. If you know from experience how much total memory across all the threads um, you can safely run an analysis on, you can divide one by the other and get a, get a feel for how many threads is safe to use, which you can then set in the tools set thread count menu item. Um, Right, that's, um, that's all I'm going to talk about with performance and um, now I want to move on to um, a new feature called Intermediate Results. And this is something that uh, uh, I know that other, other diffraction codes do, I know that certainly WAMIT does this and I, I believe um, a, a number of other, other codes um, have this capability. And it was uh, suggested to us by a number of users at the, um, the user group round we did uh, back when we released ArcaWave in 11.0. And the idea here is that um, it's common to do, to do um, calculations where you, um, you do an analysis uh, and a number of similar related analyses and the data that changes from one analysis to the next um, doesn't um, impact on the, um, on the first order boundary um, uh, solution, boundary integral matrix solutions that you um, uh, that you're performing. So, uh, I think a, you know an example might be um, if you've um, wanting to do a number of different analyses with um, different uh, center of um, center of gravity for the body. Um, you, you might, certainly in 11.0, you'd end up repeating the same first order calculation over and over again, and that's the time consuming part. Um, you then want to dis derive some displacement REOs, um, different displacement REOs for different center of, uh, uh, center of gravity, and it's, it seems wasteful to keep repeating that um, first order um, calculation. So what we can now do is we can do the first order part once, and then um, the subsequent parts which depend on that um, uh, can be uh, performed without having to recalculate the first order solution. The way we do this is um, it's a little bit similar to um, uh, restart analysis in Orcaflex. Um, we have a parent model and um, child models. The parent model uh, is where the first order solution is performed and in order to do that, you need to say, in the output options, you need to say that we want to output intermediate results. Now then, in the child model, those intermediate results can be used. Um, um, and then here you would specify uh, the name of the parent model um, in order to use, use that. So I have... Um, yeah, a little example, I think. Um, so here's my, my parent model. Um, it's the same, same old mesh. Uh, I think it's, I think actually it's the Orcaflex default vessel, um, if truth be told. And we've said we're going to do a potential formulation calculation, so just a first order calculation, and we're going to use, we're going to output intermediate results. And then um, we have, um, let's maybe pick, let's maybe pick this, this example. And this is a, uh, uh, the child model. We're using intermediate results, which we get from this, this, this parent, and um, we've made a change that we are adding some um, external um, external uh, roll damping. Um, and what we're, what we're actually going to do here is um, we're going to perform one analysis in the parent to calculate um, basically the, the first order solution and then we're going to do a bunch of quick um, calculations um, in, the, in the children with a variety of different 
um, damping um, coefficients just to get a different set of displacement REOs. Um, for those different damping levels. And I've got an automation, a pre-processing automation spreadsheet. Um, I create a bunch of different, I'm actually using YAML variation files. They're created, if I click on this, click on create text data files, then all of these files will be created. Um, in fact, yeah, well, maybe I, maybe I don't need to show, show that, but you, you, can, you can see that in each of these files, um, which are based on this on this template. In each of these files, we replace that roll damping coefficient with um, it is named there. We replace it with a value specified here, and we get uh, a YAML file that looks like looks like that. I think that was was that the one I loaded loaded up. I loaded up one hundred, didn't I? So yeah, you can see you can see that. If I if I come to run this now um, and add all these files to the batch, well, the files I want to add are the parent and all the um, all the children. But actually, I've got a a, a list file that just lists those um, uh, lists those files, so I can just simply add add that. If I click on run, um, Orcawave will process them, and Orcawave understands the dependencies. It will process the parent first. So I'm actually going to I'm going to drop the parent down towards the bottom just to show that this will get processed first and then we'll go back up and do the rest in order. Um, and you can see that um, the parent took um, a, you know, a couple of seconds but the children just zipped through almost instantly. And with, you know, with, a, with a much bigger mesh you'd, you'd see a, you know, a significant um, time saving. Now, um, there's only a handful of features, a handful of data items that you can change in, in a child analysis. So it's basically any data that doesn't impact on um, on the first order calculation. So it's, you know things like the inertia data, constraints data uh, in Orca wave terminology, um, control surface me mesh files, um, the free surface data for a full QTF calculation, and the stuff that's related to paneled quadrature and asym asymptomatic. Is that right? Asymptomatic zones. Seems like a um, asymptotic zones. Why am I say asymptomatic? It's because I'm, I've been infected by this this dreadful pandemic, and I'm saying asymptomatic because it's a it's a word that's in vogue in uh, in this year. But asymptotic is the correct word. Um, okay, um, and at the moment, um, intermediate results is is almost like a, it's a little bit like a feature without a, without a cause because. Um, the real thing we wanted to uh, wanted to add it for was for doing um, stochastic linearization. It's really going to be really effective with that, which is a, a future feature that's coming up. And Chris will it's almost almost finished, but not not in time to include in in eleven point one. Chris will demo some of that um, in a few minutes' time. Um, okay. The next thing I want to uh, look at is uh, roll damping. Um, roll damping target percentage, uh, which is a new feature. It really applies only to free floating ship shaped bodies. And um, in my model here, I've got three variants of the uh, basically of the same model. And if I look in. Um, uh, in this model, we've got zero. Um, well, there's, there's no there's no roll damping in the external damping matrix, um, and it's easy to see if I if I reset. Um, this is the new data item: increase roll damping to target percentage of critical. And if you if you uh, enable that, you can specify um, what this target percentage is. Well, let's let's reload my my results file and look at the output. Uh, and this 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 result is new. Um, the program calculates for you um, how much uh, damping as a percentage of critical there is at each um, wave period of frequency, depending which uh, which way you're operating. And this is this is something that that depends on um, 
depends on frequency. Now, because in this model we have no um, external damping, this is purely radiation damping. Um, and if you want to find out where this number comes from, uh, if I press F1, go into the help file, then you can see the formula here. What you can do is you can um, opt to say, I would like uh, to add, um, I'd like you to increase the roll damping such that we achieve a target of 10% um, overall, over all the different forms of all the different forms of damping. And when I look now at my my output, remember previously we had no additional roll damping. And here we uh, the numbers have all been inflated. And what we've actually done is we've added some additional roll damping um, uh, linear um, uh, factor. It's almost as if um, it had been uh, added into this slot here. Uh, but we've calculated it such that we will achieve a total roll damping uh, that's 10% of target. Um, we're only achieving it at one, uh, one uh, frequency. Um, and we've chosen that. Um, that is the the frequency or period um, that where the maximum roll amplitude occurs. And you know I can confirm that that is indeed at the eight second period. If I look at the graphs, um, displacement REOs. Um, I probably need to officially look at the um, the zero damping case, but it'll be it's just the same there. This is at eight seconds. Um, Now, if um, here's a case where we've said I want roll damping target to be one percent, I want to achieve one percent, but in fact, um, even just through the uh, the radiation damping, we we we've already achieved that from the radiation damping alone. So in that case, we don't add any additional extra roll damping because we've already reached one percent. So this is not um, add 1% of critical. This is um, for the frequency where the roll amplitude is at its maximum, add, um, add some if necessary to achieve this target value. Uh, just to demonstrate what happens when I import this into Walkerflex, I can open up I'll open up the 10% um, case um, and look at the other damping and we can see this was the figure that was reported in the um, in the Orca wave output and it's been transferred across to Orca Flex. Okay, back to uh, back to Orca Wave. Um, This was present in, in 11.0, um, the ability um, to add interior surface panels to remove irregular frequency effects. Now, uh, sometimes uh, these interior surface panels exist and are provided in uh, the body mesh file. So in that case, they're in the mesh. You don't need to uh, add additional ones um, and you leave this uh, data item unchecked. However, if uh, these interior surface panels are not provided in the body mesh, then you um, you check this to say um, add them. And in the previous version of Orca Wave, um, uh, there was one method for um, generating these interior surface panels, which was what, what is now called the radial method. In 11.1, we've added a second method called the triangulation method. And um, the reason we've done that is that for some cases, the radial method um, struggles, particularly if it's um, um, highly concave water lines, the radial method um, tends to break down. And for, um, for water lines, for, for, for bodies with water lines that have a large aspect ratio, for instance, a typical ship, then the triangulation method tends to perform better. And in um, one, just one other thing just to mention, 
uh, a couple of other things just to mention rather over the 11.0 uh, minor updates and i think um uh in the in 11.1 as well we've made a whole number of um, improvements to waterline detection um i won't talk about these in detail they're documented in the what's new um you can read about them there in 11.0 um Okay, when let's go, let's step back a bit. I'm talking to talk about non-planar, non-planar panels, and uh, when you import a mesh, um, you normally you, you normally want to use quad panels um, because that's a more efficient um, efficient way to work. You can you can mesh your body if you're using quads. You can mesh your body with fewer panels using quads than if you use triangles. So so generally, uh, meshes will produce meshes which are mostly comprised of quads. However, um, not all, not always, uh, do you find that these um, quads um, are planar. Some some uh, meshing tools will produce quads that aren't um, aren't planar. And in eleven point naught, we would warn about these. Um, we would use this length tolerance to compare against um, uh, the is it the projection length? I think, um, and. You know, if this tolerance was exceeded, then then um, Orcawave would spit out a whole bunch of warnings saying you've got you've got all these non-planar panels, and you know sometimes you that would mean going back to the mesh file to um, to deal with that, going back to your mesh program and remeshing and and fixing that, and uh, in fact sometimes that's still the right thing to do, but um, it can also be convenient. What you actually maybe maybe what you actually want to do is that you've got a handful of non-planar panels and you just want to um, split them into triangles. Well, uh, what you can do now is you can say um, you can ask Orcawave to do that for you. Um, check this uh, option and any panel whose projected length projection length exceeds the length tolerance, um, Orcawave will automatically split it into two two triangles. Um, which is quite quite helpful. Right, I've got three more topics to uh, to run through. QTF crossing angles and, and uh, QTF periods. These again uh, came about from feedback from uh, the last set of user group meetings and you know when you when you're analyzing um, and, and calculating uh, particularly full QTFs you can end up with an awful lot of, um, of, of cases to consider. Um, to do a second order analysis, and so one of the one of the suggestions that was made to us was um, that, uh, and this is done by a number of other programs, is to allow the user to limit which um, exactly which QTFs are calculated. Um, crossing angles applies a, a limit to the um, um, the wave headings that are uh, that are used, and, and and the way we consider pairs of wave headings. So. Uh, and the classic is so. So the rule is the rule is um, that the absolute value of crossing angle is restricted to the specific range. So with a default setting of zero and one eighty, all crossing angles are considered. But if I change this, and this is the most common uh, use, I suspect, if I change this to um, uh, zero and zero, then uh, what Orcaweb does is it restricts the calculation to unidirectional waves which will will um, can significantly um, reduce the, the the computation time uh, similarly with periods maybe you only need to consider um, certain second order um, periods or frequencies I mean this says periods but it um, you know it can equally be the frequencies um, you can maybe restrict restrict this to only consider um, frequencies around a particular um, uh, you know, particular um, resonance or, or or whatever. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, whilst all this works perfectly in Orca Wave, we we overlook the fact that OrcaFlex is uh, quite picky about exactly how the data are specified for full QTFs. And if you've if you've restricted um, crossing angles or frequencies. Um, and then exported uh, an Orca Wave results file. When you try to import it to OrcaFlex, well, it'll import fine, but when you uh, when you run um, the code, then you'll get a missing data error message, which was just um, a complete oversight on our part, for which uh, we apologise. We've 
Uh, we've fixed that in the last couple of days and that will be released in 11.1b um, which I'm hoping to do maybe next week or the week after. So the final, um, the final couple of things to mention, I'm going to uh, talk about some changes to drawing. Um, we've added a number of new extensions to the mesh view. You can now uh, let me, let's, let me zoom in a bit. You can now draw. This is quite messy like that, isn't it? You can now draw the body axes, and that can be that can be useful because the body axes can can be a little bit counterintuitive to how they're um, how they're calculated. So that's uh, an important thing to be able to show now. Um, As you saw, we have free uh, free surface panels, and that was already present. But uh, in addition, we've added the the quadrature zone and the outer circle. These things existed in eleven point zero. We just didn't um, uh, visualize them and show them uh, to the user. And once you're in plan view, you can also see um, see the wave headings that are being considered. The final thing is that we have included um, our um, old faithful measuring uh, tool that you'll be familiar from Archiflex U. Uh, use. It looks a little bit different um, now because we've included the distance, included the text right next to the cursor, which I think is a, a, is a better and cleaner user interface. And the absolute final thing to mention is the last user group meeting, um, I promised a validation document um, and Chris spent quite a bit of time uh, working on that after release. Um, so just search Orkaway validation and um, and available for download on our, download on our website, uh, comprehensive um, validation report. And that is everything I have to say. Um, I'm going to now hand over to uh, hand over control of the screen to Chris, who's going to tell you about um, some future developments. So, okay. All right. Thank you, David. Let me. Uh... Share my screen. I'm going to presentation mode. There we go. Good. Okay. Yeah. So thank you, um, thank you, David. I'm going to talk for a, just a few minutes now about um, uh, future developments uh, for Orca Wave. Um, so I mean, the important thing uh, to emphasise is that we are actively developing Orca Wave, um, and uh, to help us do that, uh, we could really um, uh, do with your feedback. Um, and so uh, there's going to be a, a plea for feedback in this um, uh, in this discussion. Um, uh, so two routes really to mention in the in the near term, there'll be a feedback form you get immediately after the webinar. Uh, so you can either send us that back straight away today or if you're going to come to the, the webinar tomorrow as well, you can consolidate all your feedback uh, into one go if you'd like. Um, and then after this week, any time in the future, if you're an Orcaflex user and you have an idea or a, a need for, for, for some uh, extra feature, then you can pop us an email and we're always happy to receive those, uh, those sorts of emails. Um, please, uh, at any time, uh, try and give us a bit of background information if you possibly can uh, with your feature requests. Um, you know, it helps both us and you, it helps us to um, implement the correct thing and understand really what you're asking for. Um, it also helps us understand the priority if we have a bit of information about the context. Um, and of course, it, it adds weight to your request as well, which is the benefit for you. So um, uh, if uh, you can give us some information about what you want to use the, the feature for, how you want to use it, it, um, uh, it will certainly add some weight to your request uh, over and above a you know, one, line, one line answer. Um, okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to discuss some some of the major, more 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 significant developments that we were working on or that we might work on in future. Um, but um, but if you have ideas uh, for for smaller things that will improve your workflow or make your life a bit easier, um, uh, then please do uh, tell us about those as well. They're quite attractive developments because they they can often help quite a lot of people at the same time if it's uh, if it improves that improves the workflow and the tool. Um, okay, so uh, don't forget the small small ideas as well. Uh, and then finally, I, I have to give a disclaimer here. 
and say that um, you, you, you request things and we take your feedback important, uh, take it seriously and it guides our development. Of course, it has to, uh, but we can't promise that we'll implement everything that, that you request. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that is obvious, uh, but it has to be said. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the second of my slides. And I'm gonna leave this up for a few minutes while I continue to talk so that you have some time to, to read the list there and, and absorb the absorb the information in it. So this is a list of, of 10 um, relatively large um, uh, future developments uh, that we, we know that there's been some request for or that there's some demand for amongst our users. Um, uh, but it's quite, a, it's quite a mixed bag of different things uh, and they're ordered uh, according to our, our understanding given the information we have, which in some cases is a bit limited. Uh, it's our understanding anyway of the, of the priority for, for these items. Um, but as I said, what we really want is your feedback on this, uh, uh, on this list. So things that are important to you that are in the list and too far down the list, please tell us if, if they're high priority to you or things that are not in the list at all, which matter to you, please tell us about, about those as well. Um, I haven't listed smaller items to save on time and space. So these are just the bigger items. Um, uh, so um, there's a list of 10 things there. What I'm not going to do is talk through each item in turn and tell you what's involved and what it's for uh, and what the benefits might be. Uh, I don't think that would be a very good use of our time. And I, I'm hoping that um, uh, if one of these is relevant to your uh, your work area, you'll recognize it immediately and know, know, know what it's all about. Uh, and if it's not relevant to you, then perhaps you don't want to hear me um, explaining it anyway. So I'm not going to talk through them one to 10, um, uh, but I'm, I'm deliberately leaving this slide up so that you can, you can see it for, for a little while and absorb the information. Uh, and obviously you can come back to the, to the recording of the webinar afterwards as well, if you need to, need to see it later. Uh, okay, that said, we're open to Q&A, and if you have questions about items that are on the list or aren't on the list, then you can always pop them in the Q&A, we can, we can discuss them at the end. Okay, so, uh, so there's a, a list for you. I know some of those have already come up in the Q&A uh, before this point in the webinar. Uh, what I am going to do, though, is, is talk about item one on the list. So the, the top item there, Morrison Elements, was uh, requested at the last series of UGMs. And it's a work in progress and we will, um, uh, it's quite far advanced, so I can give you a demo of it and it will be in the next, the next release, next major release. Uh, in contrast, some of the items that are lower down that list, I suppose, might not get developed anytime soon or in, in fact, possibly never. If some of those items at the lower end of the list get superseded by other requests, you could imagine. Um, so um, yeah, so please take that as a list, not of things that we're definitely going to um, implement in that order, but it's, it is what it is. It's, our, um, uh, it's the, the items in our, on our radar at the moment in, in our current understanding of priority order. Okay, so um, I think that's enough time on that. I'll move on now and give you a demo of item number one on the list, uh, which is the Morrison elements. So Orcaflex users will be familiar with the terminology. These are uh, line objects that attract Morris and drag. Um, uh, so they're in OrcaFlex. Why do you need them in OrcaWave as well? Uh, well, the, the, the motivation is that uh, the drag can affect the motion of the body, uh, obviously. And in OrcaWave, that means the displacement RAOs. And uh, some of the results from OrcaWave, especially the QTFs, um, uh, are dependent on the displacement REO. So you need to get the effect on the displacement REO is captured in order to um, compute your QTFs if, if you have uh, elements like this that uh, have a significant drag. Um, so Morrison drag, uh, of course, is, is, is a quadratic drag. It's quadratic in the fluid velocity, um, the relative velocity. Uh, so it has to be linearized, and we, we're going to do that using stochastic linearization, I think is the best practice, just like we do in the frequency domain for OrcaFlex. Um, uh, so that's the, the motivation, and that's the, 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 the general idea of the approach. And I've got a, a quick demo model of it here to show you. 
which is um, using Morrison elements to model a couple of bilge keels on the uh, on the hull of this uh, familiar now, beginning to look familiar FPSO mesh for the default vessel from Orca, Orca Flex. Um, so, I mean, obviously there are plenty of other application areas for, for Morrison elements, struts and trusses and arms and so on on, on uh, floating structures. And indeed, there are, there are other ways to model roll damping. There are other effects besides bilge keels, and there are other ways to model bilge keels. So don't take this as a, a definitive guide to roll damping, but it is, it is a, a demo model. So I'm going to uh, hop out of the uh, PowerPoint now and show you, um, show you the Orca Wave model here. So I have, this is another example um, of the parent and child models using intermediate results that David uh, talked about earlier. So slightly differently to David's example, I have already run the parent model here uh, and saved the results file, but I'll, um, uh, so I'm not going to run the parent and the child all together in, in, in a batch, uh, but I'll show you the parent model first, if I open that in, in Orca Wave. And what I have here is uh, a simple model with a set of wave periods and wave headings, and I have this um, familiar looking um, vessel in infinitely deep water uh, just on its own. Uh, so that's a relatively simple model and it's been run and the results have been saved, including intermediate results uh, in the outputs. So they're saved in the results file. And now I have a, a child model, which is going to add these bilge keels. So let me show you this. It's a text data file. I show you it in a, in a text editor first. Um, so this is uh, this is the only data. Um, it's just a few lines of text, um, and so there's two things going on here. One is that it's a, a variation from a base file. Uh, so all the data in the parent model specified here is going to be inherited, and then the remaining lines in the text data file just specify the the data that's different from that uh, from that base file. So what's different? Well, we're going to use intermediate results in the child. Uh, and they're going to come from the parent model as well. Uh, and we're going to say yes to have a wave spectrum, so a C state uh, that's going to be used in the stochastic drag linearization. And then we have some Morrison element data, uh, so some drag coefficients and uh, two elements positioned on, on, the, on either side of the, the hole. So uh, I open this child model in Orca wave now. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, hopefully, uh, those um, bilge keels in the uh, uh, in the mesh view. Sorry, that was my zoom toolbar interfering with my uh, navigation there. So it's the same vessel, uh, and the only difference in the mesh view now is that you can see these two Morrison elements, which are uh, positioned to represent um, bilge keels. Uh, they have drag coefficients, which are now uh, shown on this new Morrison elements page, reflecting the data we saw in the text file, uh, and and they're positioned and and and, and aligned uh, with the with the whole uh, uh, to get them where we want them on the on the mesh view. Uh, okay, and then the other data that we we saw in the text data file was that there is a wave spectrum now. So on this new wave spectrum page. Uh, we're specifying um, uh, a John Swap uh, wave train with a height and a, and a period, uh, which is very much default data. And this will look very familiar to Orcaflex users, of course. This is this is almost exactly the same way that you specify a wave train uh, in uh, in an Orcaflex analysis. Uh, so that is uh, that is the only data that's different in the child model. But this is. Uh, as David said, this is where the intermediate results functionality starts to become very valuable because you can run the parent once and that uh, is usually the most time consuming part of the analysis. And now you can change the C state uh, or the position of the Morrison elements or the drag coefficients on your Morrison elements and run, uh, run the child model uh, much more quickly um, using the, uh, the saved results from the parent model. So I can do that. I can run this child model now, and it will zip very quickly through the um, 
the wave periods and headings because it's not solving them it's just picking up the results from the from the parent model and then it uh, only really spends a significant amount of time in this model on the drag linearization so that is uh, is what matters that's what's left in the calculation if you like uh, and having linearized that quadratic drag um, it then uh, we then finish off the, the calculation with um, determining the displacement REOs using the linearized drag. So that linearized drag can go into the displacement REO um, calculation. And then uh, uh, if we were doing a full QTF uh, model, full QTF calculation would then begin with the displacement REOs that reflect the, the, the viscous drag. Um, so you would then capture the um, effect that you can't capture at the moment in, in Orca Wave 11.1. Uh, 11 okay, so that is, uh, that, that is an example of this um, pre-release uh, development model uh, running in Orca Wave uh, and generating some results with, with linearized drag on those Morrison elements. And if I switch back to my slides now, I can show you um, some collated results from that, that, that very model. So this is now showing um, uh, the results for the roll REO of that vessel for um, um, a whole set of, 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 of um, uh, wave heights in the, in the sea state. Um, uh, and what you can see is that, well, the fact that there's any variation at all in wave height of the sea state is a reflection of the fact that there is nonlinear a nonlinear effect here, the nonlinear drag, and uh, um, and, and then uh, different linearization uh, outcomes um, for sea states with uh, so tending towards zero with smaller and smaller wave heights. The quadratic drag becomes less and less significant in relevant terms, and the roll REO here and all the other results. Uh, recover the results of the parent model where there's no Morrison drag and there's no Morrison elements. Uh, but if you have a non-zero wave height in your C state, then uh, you do see uh, an effect from, from the, 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 the drag loads um, on, the, on the Morrison elements. And in fact, it's, the, it's the, uh, the effect that you would physically expect. So the roll REO is reduced by the presence reduced compared to the parent model by the presence of the bilge keels um, and, the, and the drag that they, uh, that, they, in, uh, that they feel, I suppose, in the, in the fluid. Uh, so that's, that's an example of what's, uh, of what's coming. Uh, it's not quite finished. Um, uh, and so that there might be some things that don't look exactly as we've presented them here in, in, the, in the user interface, but as you can see, the the intention is very much that it's going to look and feel familiar to users who have specified Morrison elements and specified C states and, and analogous things in uh, in OrcaFlex. Okay, so that, that's the end of the demo. Um, uh, that's definitely work in progress. It's going to be coming coming out um, uh, in the next release. Um, uh, but please do tell us your feedback on uh, on 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 this. In, in fact, but on on other development ideas, other feature requests that you uh, that you either need or would benefit from because they would make your life easier uh, using the tool. Um, and we'll use that to guide our uh, guide our development choices. Um, okay, right. So I think that that brings us brings us to the end then. Um, pretty much of the of the of the material we were intending to present. Um, should we move on to Q and A then? Yeah, let's do that. There's um, there's maybe a, uh, there's a handful of questions already in the in the Q and A that I suspect Chris uh, is best placed um, to answer. So maybe he can he can pick those up. Just uh, and if you have any more questions and you think of anything more while. Um, while um, we're answering these, please do pop them in in the Q and A, and we'll we'll deal with those. I should just mention as well that um, um, after the um, uh, at some point in the next day or so, you'll get another email from Zoom um, asking you know post it post attendance um, mail, which will have a link a a, a, a a URL for a feedback form. If you if you want to provide feedback, then please do fill that in. I, uh, maybe Chris already mentioned that, and and I was um, uh, distracted by the questions. But 
Um, that feedback's really important. Um, I think I forgot to mention it this morning. Um, so, um, yeah. Oh no, over to you, Chris, on the uh, on the on the questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we'll um, uh, we'll, we'll we'll just um, uh, rattle through the the questions that are open that we we. Uh, we, we can see in front of us. So uh, there's a couple that saved up, saved up from earlier on. So um, two or three questions about um, mesh convergence and a number of um, number of panels in the mesh. Although, you know what? I think they've they've disappeared now. I'll just I'll um, I'll talk about the ones that are left and and see if they're still in the list when we get to them. Okay. So the first question. Um, generally speaking, how can the program handle extremely shallow water? For um, drift force and or or full QTF, uh, so for instance, a, a twenty meter draft ship in in thirty to forty meter depth water. Um, so I think uh, I, I think uh, the answer to this is that there's there's no fundamental problem with with modeling that sort of system uh, in Orca Wave, um, but you you may just need to be careful about um, checking that your your results are converged with respect to the mesh. So in particular, if you're doing a full QTF calculation, uh, you, need to, you need to check. It's always best practice, but if, you, if you're worried about it, you should check that your, your results are converged with respect to um, various settings you've got for the extent and the density of the, the points that you're um, representing the free surface by. But that's all, there, there's guidance for that in, in the help the Orca wave helps, so um, uh, but there's no fundamental problem with with um, with with modelling um, shallow water depth, um, as far as I know. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, results in Orca wave are calculated referring to the mesh centre. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. I mean we we refer to it as the body origin, but I, I know what you mean. Is it Possible to have these results with respect to the center of gravity of the body. Um, that was uh, one of the items. I think it might have been number two on my list of, of future development ideas. So we know that that would be useful um, for some people. So if that's useful for you, um, please, you know, emphasize it in your feedback form. Um, but it's not possible at the moment. Does the Orkwave does Orkway feature moon pool setup and provide heave RAO? Relevant damping, um, so uh, so Orcwave is 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 uh, is capable of, of modeling vessels with moon pools. Uh, you wouldn't set it up in in Orca Wave. You would have to mesh your body and mesh the moon pool in your meshing tool, and then import it uh, through that. And if you want to damp the uh, resonances that you can see on on the moon pool surface, you can do that using a, a, an object called a damping lid in Orca Wave. Uh, so yes, I think uh, I think it can do what you're you, you're asking there. Yeah. Uh, next question: Can Orca Wave account for currents or moderate forward speeds in the direction calculation? Uh, no, it, it can't at the moment. Uh, I'm afraid uh, forward speed is um, um, is is one of the items on that that list of, of, of future developments. So we know that there's some demand for it, but but it's not not available at the moment. Uh, in the tool. Uh, so let me move on to the next one. Is small angle um, stability available to ensure the hydrostatic checks are good to go for hydrodynamic analysis? So no, um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking about, but there's no, um, there is no, um, there is no post-processing of the hydro, hydrostatic uh, data that, that, that Wave calculates. So, uh, so no, I don't think um, I don't think we have what you're you're asking about. But I'm not entirely sure entirely sure what it is. Um, uh, okay, yeah, I think I think that that's the best answer I can give to that question. Um, uh, if if you have something specific in mind that that you would like Orcawave to do, or that you you know is available in another tool and you'd like it added to Orcawave, then yeah, please uh, give us some give us some extra details, maybe in your feedback form. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. Then 
connection springs constraints to get displacement RAO is correct. How should that be understood? So that item on the, the list I gave, it was in the, in the one to 10 list, wasn't it? Um, so this is a bit like the, um, the Morrison elements. The motivation here is if you, um, uh, if you were modeling um, uh, um, uh, a platform perhaps that had two floaters with a connection between them. Um, and so there was a, an earlier question about this in the Q and A. Um, and you wanted to um, model them as two bodies rather than one body that was rigidly connected, uh, then you would need some kind of connection or constraint or spring. Um, those are all terms from, from OrcaFlex um, uh, terminology, I suppose, uh, to, to um, represent the, the relative motion of the, the two bodies in the multi-body analysis. Um, and then much like Morrison elements, the motivation is uh, to get the displacement REOs correct for then uh, ensuing analysis that is going to produce QTFs or, or C-state REOs. Uh, okay, so let me move on to the next question then. Uh, the quadratic drag must be stochastically linearized. Is it by using an error function uh, approximated by the probability integral? Uh, it's uh, so th this is the approach is, is is already in our documentation because it's the same approach as we use in the OrcaFlex frequency domain. The general idea is to is that the linearization is the 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 linear drag that minimizes the the squared error between the the linearized drag and the um, the quadratic uh, drag that you you start off with, um, uh, but there's some some proper explanation of that and some references in the Orca Flex uh, documentation uh, if you want to want to follow that up. Uh, okay, so let me move on to the next question. Uh, does Orca Wave support multi-body analysis? Uh, yes, I think that's a, a simple one to answer. Um, uh, and there's, and there's, there's no limit on the number of bodies, so you can have, uh, you can have as many as you want. Um, I think that's that's straightforward. Um, the a kind of follow up question that often accompanies that question we get asked is: Is it possible to uh, put a damping lid between two bodies if you're looking at side by side vessels, for instance, and you want to damp out the the resonance that you can see on the the free surface uh, between them if they're they're quite close together, and you you, you can do that with the the damping lid object in um, in Orca Wave. Um, so that's multi body. Uh, analysis. Uh, so on to the, moving on to the next question, uh, we need to ensure the hydrostatic is correct, i.e. Um, GM, that's metacentric height, isn't it? Displacement, et cetera. Um, yes, uh, so we report certain amount of hydrostatic information, uh, not the metacentric height, but we do report the displaced volume uh, and, and, and uh, and some of the, the, the moments, the center of flotation and so on. Um, uh, so they're reported in the hydrostatic results. Um, uh, so you can, you can check them, I suppose, QA them, uh, but there's no additional, um, there's no automated testing of, of, of that data in, in Orca Wave. Um, So let me move on to the next question then. Users may get very dependent on the program itself, um, but some post-processing features may help. For instance, velocity and acceleration REOs at any point on the body. Um, uh, or reaction load REOs um, once uh, springs and constraints between bodies were, were available. Um, multi-body relative motion, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yes, okay, so I see what you're getting at. There are, um, there is definitely more we could add in terms of um, uh, results, uh, ways of viewing the results uh, that might be, might, might be useful to, uh, to users. Um, we, I mean, for that, that is something where we really need, need your guidance. It's hard for us to know as software developers. Um, you know exactly um, uh, what the, the, the useful results quantities are for you. Um, 
but uh, but hopefully uh, you saw on the uh, on 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 the list. I think it was number two on the list, so it's quite near the top. We've already clocked the the demand for reporting results about a, a different origin than the default origin, which we, which we call the body origin. Uh, so that 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 I think that is on our radar. Um, but uh, but yes, a good it's a good point. Uh, and uh, next final question for the moment does does it predict does Orkwave predict a negative heave added mass for a floating toroid um well i i, I can't i can't give you an immediate answer i'm afraid i uh, i don't know um we have uh, one of the one of the questions in the um uh sorry one of the models in the the validation report uh, is a um uh is a essentially a, a donut shaped body uh, uh, and we capture uh, so we and we, we show how if you um, allow the resonance on the moon pool to uh, to develop then you get um, uh, I think you do get a negative added mass coefficient but I'd have to refer to the report and then we show how anyway the 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 the, the clearly non-physical um, uh, responses can be can be uh, damped out by putting on a damping lid um, uh, but uh, I don't know if you have a if you if you're referring to a specific uh, I suppose um, toroid or, or just um, uh, moon pool bodies in general. Um, if if there's a particular um, uh, case that's been well studied and would be a you know uh, an addition to the to the to the sorts of cases that are in the validation report, then then please do let us know actually because we're always on the lookout for. For, for for well studied or well documented test cases or validation cases, um, it sounds like it might be might be something in that category. So that's the um, that's all the questions for now. Um, uh, but if you have any any more, if you're still in the meeting and and you're you're hanging around, if you have any more questions that you want to ask, then do pop them in the the Q and A. Um, thread and we'll we'll stick around for a few more minutes and, uh, and and see if anything comes in Right, last chance, last chance for questions before before we sign off. Um, we'll get the the twenty second clock ticking. Um, if 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 anyone has any more more they'd like to to ask us, uh, we're, we're, you've got a captive audience at the moment, so so go for it. But if um, you know, if not, that's that's fine. I would just mention that um, when we did this session this morning. They asked more questions than you've managed so far, so so that particular group is winning the the kingly Ford battle. Um, but okay, if um, if that's if that's if that's it, that's great. Um, you know, jokes aside, uh, it's wonderful to see um, so many questions being asked um, from uh, from everybody. It's been really um, really heartening for us having having just developed this tool relatively recently to see so much interest in it, and um, we're really committed to. To taking it further and, and making it um, you know, even better than it already is. Um, we've got another session, uh, a couple of sessions tomorrow. Maybe some of you will be coming to um, on the remaining features that are new in, in OrcaFlex uh, that aren't restart analysis. So um, we'll probably see some of you um, some of you tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thanks everyone for attending, and I'll uh, we'll see you all see you all soon. Bye now.